Uh, thank you for taking the time to join us today. My name is Lisa. I'm a product manager on the Weave team. Uh, my colleague Alex here is a software engineer on the Weave team. And we are here today to talk to you about Weave and mobile. In our last ses session on Weave, we learned about uh, how Weave enables an interoperable device ecosystem. We are excited by the future of IoT devices, and we can't wait to see how this space evolves. One intersection point that is already obvious to us is the interaction users will have between with their IoT devices and their mobile phones. In this presentation, we will talk more about the app ecosystem that we envision supporting for future Weave devices, and we will walk you through what building an experience for a Weave device will look like on Android. Interoperability is one of the most important tenets of the Weave ecosystem. We want consumers to have confidence when they, build, when they purchase a Weave device that it will work with all of the existing Weave devices they already have. And we want to make sure that they have compelling and compatible choices available to them from a wide range of uh, device manufacturers. We actually expect device makers to challenge each other over time to build increasingly more compelling device experiences. Uh, the Weave mobile platform will enable them to easily interconnect not just their own devices, but devices of their partners. We also anticipate that app developers will be able to add a lot of value to this ecosystem and build unique experiences that further increase the value users get from their Weave devices. We recognize that most IoT devices, unlike our mobile phones, are often shared devices. And not everyone who uses the same IoT device will necessarily use the same mobile operating system. We will support development platforms on Android, iOS, and web. This will allow developers to build both apps and services on top of Weave devices. The diagram behind us paints a very simple picture of why we think the Weave platform can help accelerate and simplify development for these developers. For an app developer today who wants to integrate with three devices, and let's just say for simplicity that these are devices of the same type, they have to work with three different APIs from three different manufacturers. Or in a worst case scenario, want to integrate with a device that does not have an API available because the, devel the device developer has not yet devoted resources to that or they don't have an existing partnership with this developer to make that happen. With Weave, developers will have a single API interaction point with all Weave devices independent of type. And Weave enables this by working very closely with device developers to develop, to develop public schemas for functionality that we know devices of a particular class share. For example, Every single light bulb you have at home supports the capability to turn on and off. There should be no reason why sending a command to this kind of device is different uh, depending on the OEM. Optional functionality, like sending brightness, for example, should also be standardized. This does not preclude, of course, developers from adding unique functionality to their devices. And you can learn more about our device schemas on the Weave developer website. I'm going to hand things over to Alex now, who's actually going to walk us through what building an app on Android will look like for Weave. We will have a collab session tomorrow where you will actually get the, uh, the opportunity to try a collab with, one, with, with an upcoming update uh, of our Weave APIs on Android. Over to you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, <clears throat> so in, in this section, uh, we'll focus on how you'd use Weave Android APIs to build an application that works with Weave device and which steps you need to take to, in order to get it up and running. Um, now, when you work with the uh, Weave devices, we would like you to focus on what you would like to achieve and not on how you would do that. So all the semantics uh, of a device is what you care about, right? Uh, Weave is a very, very broad platform. So we support cloud device, we support local device, we support different authentication mechanisms, and so on. So when using our APIs, you will not need to care about any of that. So as long as the device is what you care about, so you can see, hey, does this device have a feature I would like to work with? And if so, you can start an act. Um, before we move on to the actual code, I'd like to spend a few minutes and talk about the life cycle of Weave API. So which steps do you need to do to get APIs working for you? Uh, now, any one of you who ever used Google Play services would feel immediately familiar with Weave APIs. Uh, we have a concept of Weave API client, which is very similar to that of Google API client. Uh, and working with it, uh, would be really familiar to you if you ever use Google API Client. Now, Weave API Client is required for every API call, and it has a life cycle. And by that, I mean that before you try to use any of Weave APIs, you would need to connect to the API Client, and after you're done using it, you need to disconnect from it. Um, now, one important property of 
Weave API client is that we require that Weave application is installed on a user's device. We believe that um, this would bring two benefits, both for developers and for the users. For developers, you will not need to care about API updates, so we will do that for you. So all the fixes and so on, they will be pushed by us along with Weave app updates. And secondly, for users, they would have a consistent experience across the board. So there will not be a case when the user will have two applications that target the same types of devices, but one updated uh, our API library, and now they can see more devices than the other one. So if we have applications not installed, be prepared to handle an error. So the API will fail, and we will give a special status code resolution required. And this will also include an intent that you will need to launch, and we'll fix things for you. So nothing else that you need to do here. So before you start using Weave API client, you need to configure it. When you build the API client, there's two important properties that you need to specify. First is you need to add APIs that you're going to be working with. Now, there are three APIs that we have, app access, device, and command APIs, all of which I'm going to talk in just about a minute. Um, you also need to supply connection callbacks to the API client. And connection callbacks is our way of telling you that APIs are ready for consumption. Once you're done with that, and once you have your API client set up, uh, you need to connect to it. When you do so, uh, our connection callbacks, uh, there's an unconnected method. And at this point, this means that Weave APIs are ready for consumption. Now, again, all of this will be familiar to those of you who are using Google Play services. And so the life cycle is exactly the same as you would expect from Google APIs. Um, once you're done using Weave uh, API client, please disconnect from it. Uh, we did it on pausing here in this example. So working with Weave devices, what does it involve? Uh, it's actually four steps. First is you need to ask user for permission to grant access uh, to Weave device for your application. Secondly, you need to find the device you're going to be working with. Third is you need to get to know your device. Is it the right type of device? Is it ready for use? Does it have the right features, and so on? And fourth part is act, which is send commands to your Weave device. Now we're going to walk over each of these steps in more details. So first is asking for permission. Now, we defined a permission model that will put user in control. And so before any application tries to access any of user's devices, it will need to request access. So what you'll need to say, you'll need to specify device type, as you'll see in a moment, and what kind of role you'd like to have on a device. And the user will be able to see which devices he's willing to grant access to. So the way you do that is you create an app access request. And there's three important fields that you need to fill in. First is your role on a device that you would like to get, whether it's a user, a viewer, or a manager. Second one is types of devices that your application is aware of and can interact with. And third one, you need to supply us the um, project number that you would take from Google Developer Console. And this is our way of identifying your application for sending out requests. Now, uh, there is a few caveats uh, of how you do that. So please minimize the role that you request into the minimum role that uh, would allow you to cover all your use cases. Now suppose you have an application that shows temperature inside your house, so it uses read sensor data and displays the temperature to a user. You probably do not want to request manager access level to users' devices, because it might be surprising for a user. And, and as a rule of thumb, do not surprise the user in ways he does not expect. Um, once you have the request, uh, you'd use our app access APIs to request access. And if this succeeds, um, we'll return you an intent that you need to launch uh, in order for the user to go through authentication flow for your application. At this point, please use, uh, make sure that you use start activity for result, because that's the only way for us to know the identity of the calling application and for you to see the result of user's action. Otherwise, you'll be in the blind. Once you have that, um, what you see on the left side of the slide is authentication flow. So the user will see that application such and such is requesting access to these types of devices and request this kind of role. Now, the user can selectively choose which devices he's willing to grant access to. Suppose there is the use case of user uh, and uh, surveillance cameras application that is requesting access to, his, to view his cameras with some cloud solution. So the user might be OK to try this new application with his outside cameras, but not so sure about whether he would want to grant access to his bedroom cameras, and so on. So he would be able to selectively choose which devices he's willing to grant access to your application. And also, possibly, if you request manager level of access for, a, like I said, thermometer app, the user will be able to say, that's not what I would like to do. I would like to only give a viewer access level, because that's what it seems like this application does, and that's the sufficient level. Uh, at any point in time in the future, the user will be able 
to go to Weave application and update the settings for any particular application. So he would be able to add device, he would be able to update access level for existing devices, and so on. Once the user acknowledges um, his choice, uh, your application will receive result OK as a result of activity execution. And this means that user made his choice, and you're free to start device discovery, and selected devices will appear in your application. Now, we build uh, application permission model in a similar way to Android's runtime permission. And so it has the same caveats of usage that you would expect from runtime permissions. First one is, if the user said no, do not just request it again. Uh, make sure the user understands the choice. If your application uh, works with Weave devices, but the feature is not really obvious at this point, try to educate the user so that when he sees the screen with a permission, it's not a surprise for him. If he says no, and this is a critical feature of your application, again, don't just request access again. Uh, try to explain to the user why you would need uh, to request access to his device again. Um, the only exception to that rule of not asking multiple times is when you would update your application with some new features. Now, if you take the example of Thermometer app, suppose you can now not only read the temperature inside your house, but you can also set the temperature on a thermostat. So all of a sudden, your application cannot be a viewer of device. It needs to be a user, because you need to set the temperature for a device. At this point, when you have elevated permission, you might ask for access again. And again, use your best judgment whether you would like to educate the user why you're doing that or not. And the second case is, again, when you have a f uh, feature that would allow you to extend your support of Weave devices to multiple device types that were not previously present. So at this point, you can say, hey, I would like to request access to those new device types that I now support. Now, OK, uh, we got it out of the way. So, and the user said, yes, please use my devices. You need to discover those. So for this, we have discovery APIs as part of our device APIs. To use those, uh, you would call the start loading method and supply a callback. And this callback will will be receiving a snapshot of all devices that are available to you. Now, those would be cloud devices, local devices, and you should never care about which type of device you're working with as long as the semantics is right for you. When you're done with discovery, uh, you call stop loading, and uh, this will free up some resource for the user. Now, to reiterate that, discovery is a very expensive operation. So we might use multiple sensors on a device to discover a device. We might send requests. We might use cloud connection. We might use local connection. We might use Bluetooth, and so on. So, as soon as you don't need it, please stop the discovery and uh, save up some resources. Devices are also returning a buffer. And one thing I'd like to point here is that as soon as you don't need the buffer, please release it. Uh, it will save up some resources. But before you do so, uh, make sure that you freeze all devices that you would like to still re maintain access to. So suppose you have thousands of devices uh, that you can have access to, but you only care about one particular device. It might be a good way to just freeze this one device and freeze the buffer with, with the rest of the devices so you could save up some memory and provide better experience for our users. Now that you have your device, uh, what you would like to know is you would like to know what this device can do for you. Is it, does it have the right features? Can I execute some of the commands in the device? Is it of the right type? Is it ready? And so on. And for this, uh, you would need to get some information about a device. There's two main components to that that we define as part of Weave protocol. One is uh, command definitions, and the other one is device state. I'm going to talk about both of those, starting with command definitions. So command definitions are our way of describing what device can do for you. So what kind of commands it supports? What kind of parameters do those commands take? Do you have sufficient permissions or sufficient access level to a device in order to execute this command? Let's take uh, jump command as an example here that you can see on the slide. Um, so as you can see, this jump command requires you to be at least a user on the device. And it has a single parameter called height, which is an integer. And it takes values from 1 to 100. Now, based on the command definition alone, uh, you can build up a UI to execute any command on any Weave-enabled device that you would like. But to help you a little bit, and here uh, we're grouping uh, command definitions into packages. And so packages are per device type. Now, they can be a, say, base package, which is applicable to all device types out there. And it will contain commands that are absolutely must be implemented by any device type, say, rename command, right, or something like this. For you camera manufacturers, they can be a camera package that will contain specifics uh, specific commands that can be executed on a camera. Say, 
ISO setting or file size or raw versus JPEG output and so on. Now, for any package, there would be some standard commands and there would be custom commands. So any package is extensible, but there is a core set of commands that any device of a particular type needs to implement in order to be called, say, a camera. Um, so based on that, you might be able to uh, build a UI that works for your application. And if you are a manufacturer and you know of some advanced capabilities of your devices, we would provide those as well as part of command definitions. You would be able to build up a better experience for the users. So to get those command definitions, you would use command APIs, get command definitions, and supply device ID. Now, you might notice it, uh, any API that works with devices or to get some info about a device will take just device ID, so you don't need to keep the entire device resource uh, alive uh, in order to execute further API calls. So the second part is uh, device state, and device state would describe what device looks like, what's going on with this now. Now, this can be as simple as some statistics about device, such as on-off state or battery percentage, or this can be more complicated or more structured information about a particular device type. Say for cameras, there would be light sensitivity. And you could use, again, device APIs uh, in order to get this device state using the get device state method. So now onto the fun part. So you found your device. Um, you know what it's capable of, you know it fits your criteria, and you would like to execute a command on it. For this, we have a command execution APIs. Now, when you want to execute a command, uh, you would build it based on the command definition that you read earlier. If you know that you're targeting a particular type of device, say a thermometer, a light, or so on, um, say a light, um, you know it does have a command on off. So you don't technically don't need to execute get command definitions if you only want to build a very simple application. You could just construct a command because you know there is a standard set of commands that every light bulb will support. You would do so by setting a name. So in our example, there was uh, jump or set light for a light. And you would add a parameter, which is parameter name and parameter value, to the command and build that. Once you have the command, you'll use command APIs in order to execute that. You will supply device ID and this command that you just constructed and send it over to a device. So, Command execution is not an immediate process. And so things will take time. Some things can go wrong. It might be due to user error. It might be due to some device state. It might be due to connectivity, and so on. And so you might want to check what's going on with command that I just sent. And for this, we supply <coughs> a get a method that will give you a command information about any command that you send for execution. Now, it takes command info get ID, uh, which is ID of a command, and you will receive that when you insert a command for execution onto a device. OK, so to iterate that, uh, there's four things that you need to do uh, in order to build a functional application that works with any Weave device. First is you need to ask user a permission and only do it once. Secondly, you need to find device you're going to work with and shut down discovery as soon as you don't need it. Third is get to know your device. Is it ready? Does it have the right features? What can I do with that? And fourth is act on your device, which is just create a command and send it over for execution on your device. Now, with that, um, I think that's all for our session. Um, as Lisa mentioned, we'll have Code Labs tomorrow where you'd be able to get your hands on our new APIs and uh, try it yourself and build a functional Weave application. So it should take you, you know, within an hour, you should have, be up and running and working with any Weave device out there. So I encourage you to attend, and thank you for your attention.